Uh, but it's uh, now to something somewhat different. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do, yeah, somewhat different. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is, uh, of all you here in the room, can I ask to raise your hand if, if you are not a speaker or related to a speaker here or involved in this directly in this session, if you are unrelated to the session you're here as a, as a participant of the conference? Raise your hand. Excellent. Opposite. The other group, raise your hand so I get a sense. Okay, good. We're seeing a clustering here. Right? Have you ever noticed something? They're over here. Uh, and you are over there in the back trying to flee the moment something happens you don't like. Um, the other question I have for you, who of you here in the audience is, um, and that's for all of you, is somebody who does research? Raise your hand if you are mostly somebody who provides programs or supports researchers doing their thing. Okay, good. Um, and that means that no matter what I'll now do, this will be whether you're part of the team, whether you're somebody who just randomly walked in here because you thought it might be interesting. Um, what we're doing from now on might be interesting for you in some ways or another. And just to give you a sense of what we're doing in the next hour is I have about a half an hour to talk with you about broader impact plans, and as it was in the program, it's all about your strength, or um, what we're really doing is uh, looking at unveil, uh, unveil your research impact identity. And you'll, what I'm trying to do here is give you a sense of bringing this all together, what you've heard, um, and putting a bow around it that might be a helpful heuristic or a bigger picture thing that you can take home uh, and into your life. And after I do this for half an hour with a little bit of audience participation, uh, we'll break into groups, and we had a fantastic group of speakers here today, and they're still here, and what we will do is we'll put them in corners, and you have about a half an hour to rotate or stay with one or, or some of them and discuss certain kinds of things you might want to go deeper into that have been, so to say, touched on and introduced to the talks today. It gives you a great opportunity to kind of browse and forage and uh, get a little more in-depth. So that's, that's the plan for the next hour. So let me start with this idea of an impact identity. And the first thing I want to mention is what you've heard over the course of this morning, if you were here or this afternoon, and if you haven't, then let me summarize, is that if you are a researcher and you live and you want to do something that takes your research out of the intellectual merit, which is when you talk to your colleagues, and do something in broader impact, which is when you talk to anybody else, that's my definition of what that damn thing is. Um, so if you want to talk to anybody else or do something for anybody else but the people who are your colleagues, how would you choose that? And what we've heard over the course of the day is that there are endless options that you have. And the problem when you have choice is, of course, how to make the choice. Because when you make a choice, you made lots of choices not. And that's the problem with that, right? So, the easy way, of course, is you go online. This is um, a European website, and if you're a researcher, you go in there, and these are 280 projects that have been analyzed for how researchers can engage with the public, and they are all classified in all sorts of categories, and you, you go through this thing, and this is endlessly long on the web website. You can click on what it is you're interested in, and then it spews out some version of um, a, a rearrangement of the projects, and I give you, I put in decision, and then you see that it gets a rearrangement and allows you to think about differently about various kinds of categorizations. And I don't want you to look at this more than as a piece of art, uh, because I don't think that helps a lot. Because, and I give you as an example, for the longest time in SPSS, in the program was a decision tree in the back that allowed you to go through and say, if then, if then, if then, and at the end you end up knowing what statistical method to use. They got rid of that. There's a reason for that. <laughs> and because I would make the claim that it's not as simple as going through a taxonomy, this is not identifying a dead bird on a beach. So <laughs> this is a little more complicated than that, I would argue. And that's why I want to talk with you a little bit about the idea of developing. I call. Huh? I call. OK. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, it's important you go out there on the beach and identify those birds, um, because that's important. And I, I was actually stunned how much insight you get out of that. Um, but this is about you, um, and so let's, let's, let's talk about you. Um, so the first thing when you ask yourself, what is my, what is my identity? And it is, it's kind of 
the multidimensionality of that. And this is a complicated one, and I don't want you to memorize this and I'll test at the end, but it only shows you that the complication when you ask yourself, what is my research identity, what's my impact identity, and are they different? And when you think about this, is, there is the field that you're in, or the discipline, right? There is society, and how are they interacting? What, what about your field is interesting for other people in society? If you're a string theorist, you know, do you want to go into a kindergarten and talk about your work? Um, this is the kind of question at the end of the day that you're going to answer. But, but there's your field, the discipline, there's society, societal needs, there's a the scholarship you're engaging in, there's the institution you're in. Uh, you can be at a university, a nonprofit, in a, in a commercial enterprise, in industry, you can be in all sorts of places. There's the capacity you have. Um, you may love children or hate them. You may be a wonderful speaker or a lousy speaker. You may be wonderful in one-on-one in -on -one interactions, or you might be very shy and don't like that, do that. Um, you may, so there's so many things about you and your capacity that you want to explore. And the you is, what are you really passionate about? And we'll get to that. So you can simplify this more complex thing about how to choose um, by basically saying field, you, capacity, and society. And, and at the end of the day, um, the, the impact sweet spot in research and in the way in which you interact with, with, with the public, if you do that, lies somewhere in where the field, the discipline, the stuff you research, and society overlap, where you and your passion overlap with your capacity to do things. And when this all comes together, you found not only a sweet spot for your career, in terms of a researcher or a professional or a science-based professional, but also as somebody who can talk to Aunt Sally at Thanksgiving or anything broader than that. Um, so that's the idea, that you want to find that sweet spot and nurture it over time. And, and I'm saying this, and I'm not quite sure but, um, whether that is something that's generally shared. It's, it's something that comes very, I have, I have an expert blind spot on that. To me, this is very natural to think about this. But my sense is this is not something that we systematically uh, kind of pursue as individuals when we think about our work, particularly in terms of that broader impact, the kind of what is my role as a scientist or researcher in terms of society and how do I nurture that over time rather than do it a scatter shot, do one thing or another. I think Jennifer was a beautiful example of that as a scientist artist. She carves out a niche that completely makes these things overlap in some ways that I found really fascinating, wonderful example. Um, that we saw this, um, that was this morning, right? Um, so here's another example that I already had on the slide, so I'm going to give it. Um, and his name is Carl Karlstrom. He's from the University of New Mexico. And, and he's a geomorphologist who is connected to the land and he's committed to diversity. He is connected to the National Park Service. He works in a graduate school. He has students. He likes students. That's also important. Um, he knows how to do things on a shoestring. Um, and he is in awe of geologic time. He has a sense of the spiritual and scientific preservation of, of ethnic things. So he really likes to bring these things together. And what happened over time and over many years in working with people in the National Park Service is that he created this trail of time as his way of expressing his broader impact identity as a person who brings in his passion, his beliefs, his capacities, and his connections and his partnerships, and that's what he does. So as an example, so this is not, it's not, it's not a, um, an accident that he ends up there. And we could bring in Julia here with uh, the idea of, of coast and of citizen science and create this kind of post hoc analysis of why people do what they do. The trick is to not have the survivors of this process be the one to tell you the story, but for you to go forward and craft that for yourself actively. How do you do that? I think there are three dominant ideas behind that, which is, and we're not going to touch on that, it's way too big, is the idea of dis that your discipline and society, what are the natural connections between your research and societal needs that you, that you might find interesting to talk with other people about. The other one is the identity. What is your intrinsic motivation? How can you enhance, how, how can they enhance your research impacts and your satisfaction in doing things? You need to have fun doing this stuff. Then there's the capacity, uh, and I mentioned that. And the capacity you roll in, not only what your institution is and what you can do, but you bring it all together, uh, the kinds of connections you make and the connections you have. And at the end of the day, you can ask yourself the question, what should or could I do? That's the first question, science and society. The second one is, what do I love doing? <laughs> That's you. And the third one is, what can I do? 
and then you bring them together. And we'd like to explore that now for a few minutes here in the room, potentially. So the first one I'd like to explore is not this one, because we would be here until nightfall, and lots of wine would have been drank and beer and whiskey. So let's not do that. Um, let's go here. You. I'd like you to talk to people, think, pair, share, um, in your vicinity. This is where it's bad to do the Pauli principle of human um, interaction in a, in a room where you sit as far away from one another as possible. If you were in Switzerland, you were all sitting in the front together. Uh, but we're in the United States, you like your distance. Um, so I'm German, so sorry. Um, so find somebody and have a discussion around what you love doing. And when I say what you love doing, this is the idea that we saw as examples. You can work behind the scene and help develop the trail of time or work with the exploratorium as an advisor. You can be out in the front and, and be an interpreter. What do you love doing? What is the thing that you like to do when you engage about your research with a potential public? You get three minutes to talk about it. I hate it erupting. 15 more seconds. Thank you. Bring you back. 
Yes, we're all here again. Nice. Now I want everybody to give me a half hour explanation of what you thought. No, no. Um, if, if some of you just want to throw out a few ideas that surprised you about what you just discussed about yourself. Anybody had anything that came up in this discussion that surprised you or that you find worth sharing? Tell me. Yes. Here we go. <laughs> Anything else? Garbage. Garbage. What, what about garbage? <laughs> yes, please say more. Otherwise, I think that you think what we're doing here is garbage. <laughs> Ah, so we have curiosity about people's, pe what people discard. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And I see a citizen science project on sociolo in sociology coming up. <laughs> Anything else? Because, yeah. So that's your passion, yes. Now we're going to go to something different, thank you, which is, what can you do? And I like to do the same thing again. We can leave the lights on if that was something. Um, <laughs> I don't want the people to fall asleep while talking. Um, so do the same thing. Talk a little bit about what, what, what it is that you feel you have a particular strength in terms of what can I do. And, and I can tell you, this is an example for myself, um, see, there is, I like to hear myself talk. <laughs> so I can do that. And what I need to do is to contain myself and normally bring some structure in that prevents me from talking and instead listen. So for me, for instance, the answer to that is not what I can do, I cannot do, and I want to strengthen that part. So that's, that's another component that you can think about um, in terms of what you would like, what you feel you have capacity to do. So I give you another two, three minutes to talk about what you can do. And that includes the institution you're at and the capacity for partnership that you can form. Where are they? 
15 more seconds. to the group. Thank you. That was lovely. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. And we're back. Nice. Nice. And, and again, if somebody has an idea about something that surprised them or that find worthy of sharing with people in the room, this is an opportunity to tell in terms of your capacity and what you just discussed that might be worthy of others to listen to or hear briefly. Anybody? That's okay. Yes? We talked about different skills of uh, science communication and connecting um, different types of science to different people mm -hmm. and having um, those impacts really hit home on them and impact their decision making. Thank you. Yes? Great. The broker, a bridge, a bridge person. Yes, that's very important. Thank you. I'm going to say I think we both discovered that we can do certain things in a professional setting with professional audiences, but we can do other things with family members. So you, you point out the difference that you have to have and that you have in terms of interacting with your peers versus non-peers. Mm -hmm. So being aware of what these are is important. OK, yes, in the back. Nice, thank you. Well, and, and it's indeed, as I'd claimed, that the impact sweet spot is where these things come together. And I'll, I'll let you explore two of those dimensions, and of course there are others, and this is a two-day workshop comparison to half an hour, so this is only to nibble, um, but, and to raise the awareness of what that might look like. But these discussions around where your strength lies is what I would venture to speculate is something particularly forward-looking that you should nurture just as much as you should nurture your systematic career in your research, no matter where that takes you. Um, it's, it's kind of another thing that we're probably not exploring this way at this point in time, but what now? And one of, the, one of the ways to think about this research versus research impact identity lies in thinking through how how a bio or a narrative of yourself that you tell others would sound different if you tell that narrative to a colleague versus to Aunt Marge. How are you telling people about yourself when it is someone else but your colleagues? It's difficult enough, I understand. If you, have to, if you had ever written, who of you has a bio, like a set bio? Who of you does not have a bio of somewhere between 100 and 300 words? Raise your hands. Huh? Who, who does not have a bio somewhere between 100 and 300 words that you can share with somebody if they asked you for a bio? Raise your hands. So most of you have a bio that you wrote. Who of you has written, which, tell me if this bio is written, raise your hand, if the bio is written for peers. Raise your hands. Raise your hands if you have a specific bio that is written for non-peers. One, two, three, a few of you. Okay, great, great. Um, and 
Then, as you can see, I have here a think pair share. Let's do this in the group. For those who have done a bio that is not for non-peers, can you tell me what criteria you apply to write a bio for non-peers? Tell me some of, the, some of the things you do in your bio for non-peers that is different from the bio for peers. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you personalize your, so what you do is you personalize yourself as an, as an individual, as an, yeah. I phrase my activity in a way that others can relate to. So for example, I don't talk about my specific study system for my research, I just say, I study how climate change affects animals over time. So you're going way level up in terms of abstractness, you don't want to detail as much, okay. Yes? Right, and is that because you have the, so, so you're saying you're, you're looking more at the big picture rather than the, the, the component of the big picture? Is that because you assume that your colleagues know about the big picture? Or, yes, you, you assume that they know that and you assume that the, the public more or less does not know much about the details that you're telling them about. Okay, so you're trying to place more, more the context of it. Okay, anything else? Anybody else have any other criterion for how to write that bio differently? Yes? Every jargon word, get rid of jargon words in your bio for the public, okay? Okay, anything else? Did you notice something about what people are saying about the bio that has to do with science communication that we discussed previously and that was discussed yesterday, hopefully? <laughs> it's the same principles. You just mentioned the same principles that you would use. If I were to give you a, um, if you gave a scientific presentation and I invite you to the Museum of Science in Boston and say, give a presentation on the current science and technology stage there about something that currently happens for the audience that comes there on a regular basis, I'd give you very similar advice. Personalize yourself, tell a story about yourself, don't use jargon, go to the big picture, contextualize everything you say, and ultimately, the exercise of writing this other bio is also an exercise in beginning to see your expert blind spot, in seeing the connection you have to society, and in developing the sense of what it means to position yourself and your research and your science into a broader societal context. In other words, you're working on your broader impact identity bio rather than your intellectual merit bio in National Science Foundation terms. And I think that's, that's, that's why this is an, an excellent exercise to position yourself in that way. That doesn't tell you yet what kind of thing you would systematically do in the future, but it's certainly a great way to, to begin the process. So with that, I want to end. And now we're going to the next step, because the next step is different from what it's here. The next step is that we would like to give you an opportunity to connect to the teams that have been presenting this morning and this afternoon. And that means if you're interested in exploring some of the ideas around, let's say, citizen science, talk to Julia. Here, that's Julia, okay. You like to talk about issues related to working at a museum, a science museum, and helping in a design team. Talk to, where are you, Denise? Talk to Denise. Maybe Denise, you can go over there somewhere. Um, if you wanna talk a little bit about and explore what it might have meant and what it takes to do something in the intersection of art and science, talk to Jennifer. She's here in the front. Um, if you are interested in exploring collaborations between you and your research and the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife, I'd combine the two of you, if I may, um, talk to Tim and Sean. Sean, and maybe you can go over here, the side. Um, Let's see, who do we still have? Um, there is the idea, okay, if you're, yeah, that's right, I'll go, I'll go to the back first. Um, if you're interested in asking yourself how to design places for exciting ways of active play-like learning, um, I think we have in the back, raise your hands, um, and I've forgotten. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, if you're interested in understanding how you would do research around the effectiveness of partnerships or of experiences that people have in these places, 
talk to? Yes. Um, and you, you got to position yourself here. And if you are interested in exploring more about the ISMOOC project, that is the foundation um, of, this, uh, of this session, um, I would say, who wanted to do that? Yes, Louise and Martha. And what would you like to talk about? Design and visuals. Did, ah, yes, the visualization component. Um, a, a bit of my, my own thing um, is, if you want to understand how you can use visualizations or the principles behind visualizations to make better narratives and better communicate, and I would assume probably it is in terms of how to make them as well as how to teach them and how to make people use them. That's over here with Nick and Carol. And now we have a last one, which is professional development. That's, that was, that was still, you're going to do, okay. That's the eye swoop is really also looking at how do you help interpreters um, do a better job in the interpretation of scientific, uh, science in general to the public. Okay, so this is, the, this is a group of people. Um, yeah. And then for me, that's a good thing. So that's a good point. I'm going to be here in the front. And if you have any interest in exploring more deeply what it means to do broader impact identity and link that potentially to the typology of ways in which scientists can engage with the public, I'm going to be up here. We have our own project on that from NSF funded, but I don't want to go into that right now. So we have actually work that we're doing on this as well. Now, with all that, of course, you now have not, no, you don't know anymore which one it is, but we're going to do this in a sense of 10 minutes in one group, and then I give a chance to actually change. And you can go to the next group. We have about 15 minutes for each group, but let's say 10, and it's going to be 15. So uh, at this point in time, uh, hopefully you remember which group. Um, raise your hands again if you're a group and find a group and talk to them. This is also an opportunity for you to simply ask questions to the presenters if you didn't have a chance to ask questions this morning and this afternoon. Okay, let's go.